The Egyptians lived their lives according to their obsession with the afterlife. The Greeks did not believe in a life after death, rather that they believed immortality was achieved by making a name for yourself um, through physical achievements, through beauty, through speech. The, the Greeks gave us democracy. Um, they gave us the Olympics. They left a legacy in art that still really inspires today's architecture, literature, and even our theater. So when we look at, at Greek sculpture, we're going to look at the archaic or the old period of ancient Greek, um, or Greece. And it's thought to really have, have been the beginning of Greek history. However, there was a time before the archaic period uh, referred to as the Greek Dark Ages. And it was a time of just low population due to limited food supplies. Um, there was lawlessness, a lack of art, uh, the Ill illiteracy, so not being able to read. They had kings, but you know the kings were very poor. They were farmers. They were thieves. They were pirates. Um, and so it was just kind of a dull period in, in Greek um, Greek art. Um, so you know. Really, they had no contact with the outside world, like the Egyptians did. The Egyptians, you know, learned from other people. Uh, the Greeks were on islands. Um, so, again, all of this kind of changed during the Archaic period. And so when we look at art, we're going to look at stuff from, from starting from there. So, during the Archaic period, artists began to develop a new type of, of large freestanding, so sculpture in the round, uh, statues made from a variety of media, wood, um, terracotta, which is a red clay, or even white marble. And these freestanding statues were always human figures, and they would have been found to mark graves or lining the entrance of, of temples. They were life-size or, or larger, and they were usually standing straight up. So you remember that Egyptian pose, the, the characteristics where you had that one foot forward? Okay, well, the Greek sculpture had characteristics known as the archaic smile. It's a term dubbed by historians to describe a shared facial expression in all the statues from, from this era. Now, these statues are either called a core, uh, which was meant to be a, a young woman um, in Greek who is clothed, and then she has a counterpart, a koros, uh, or I'm sorry, koroi, um, which is meant to be a young man um, who would have been nude. So here is a standing youth koroi uh, from, from the archaic period. Um, he was a, a grave marker uh, of an Athenian aristocrat um, in an ancient city of Attica, which is kind of present-day Athens. This koroi uh, pose, you know, recalls that of the Egyptian sculpture. So, like Egyptian figures, this this young Greek is shown frontally. His arms are are by his side. His fists are clenched and one leg is straight in front of the other, just like the, the Egyptian pose. Okay, Does this remind you of, of a statue that we just recently looked at in ancient Egypt? Menkura and his queen. So However, what, what separates this statue from the Egyptian sculpture is the fact that he's standing without the benefit of a support. If you can remember that statue of Menkura and his queen, if you look at Menkura, uh, do you see these the similarities? You know, they have the same stance to them, uh, the same rigid pose, but look at, you know, we've got a little bit more of an ankle here. Um, a little bit more definition, even in in the the abdomen, um, you know, a, a thinner chest. We've lost that. We've got that negative space has has been taken out. So, 
the Greek artist was able to find balance of the, the 2,000 pounds of solid marble on these slim little ankles. It's a, it's a major technical achievement that's happened here. And he's literally standing on his own two feet. He's, he's self-reliant and he's self-sufficient. So what makes it different from the Egyptian statue is that the artist shows, uh, you know, ridges and grooves in the body, which is a development of creating forms, of giving the statue a, a more realistic appearance. All right, this is the Peplos core. Remember me talking about a core, which is a, a clothed female figure. Um, it was originally thought that she's wearing a peplos, uh, which is a Greek costume that would have been pinned at the shoulders um, and then fallen down much like this. So it, the sculpture was found in 1886, and it was found in three pieces at the Acropolis in Athens near a, a, a building called the Erechtheum. The Acropolis was like the, the main city, the, the top of the hill. And so here are some other Kore figures, um, and they were you know, generally offerings to the goddess Athena. Athena was the, the, god, uh, or the goddess of Athens. All right. So, you know, she would have who you've been paying homage to at the, one of the Acropolis. Um, and so people, you know, originally art historians thought that, that that's what the statue was. Um, however, research suggests that the Peplos core is actually not a Korai, but a goddess. So is she just an offering or is she a goddess herself? And some people still stick that she's wearing the Peplos um, and as an indicator, um, but other research has shown, you know, careful scientific research suggests that she's a goddess, perhaps um, Artemis, the goddess of Hunt, or Athena. So this would have been originally colored, and, you know, these statues, in my opinion, look beautiful in their natural state. So it's hard for me to, to really, you know, imagine the statue being colored. But she was, you know, originally possibly wearing a crown made of bronze, made of gold, and, and some earrings. And so this is examples. On the left-hand side, you have Artemis. Uh, you know, on the, the right-hand side is the suggestion that she was Athena. But Artemis was the goddess of the hunt, and so she often carried a bow and an arrow. And what's frustrating about this sculpture is we don't know, you know, where what's going on with her left hand. So a lot of, you know, um, coarse Kore statues would have had their left hand, um, you know, put out. And that's why originally everybody thought that that's what this was. But then there's this idea that she might have been carrying a, a um, bow and arrow. Now, I want to show you a dramatic difference in geometric proportions and the idea of getting closer to more realistic uh, looking figures. So if you look over on the right hand side, we have the standing youth, which is what we looked at. So about 580 BCE. And then about 50 years after this, look at the figure on the left hand side. Look at the change. We've got more of a, instead of a cankle now, we have an ankle. Uh, there's more definition in the thighs. We have a broader, uh, you know, more muscular looking uh, figure. Even the eyes and the face have changed a lot. Um, so we're getting somewhere in our geometric portions. Same thing with, with the female you know, core. So over on uh, the right-hand side, again, we have a core built 40 years before the peplos core that we know. Again, if we look at this one, it's, she's broader, she's more boxy, and the peplos core has a more feminine curve to her. Even the facial features have changed dramatically. The face is no longer so you know, elongated as much. The eyes have become smaller and more proportional. Uh, you know, the... the Look at the feet over on the right-hand side, how they just tried to show the feet 
uh, position here, and we have a sense of, of more of a, of a figure over on the left-hand side. Even the sense of that negative space, you can see over on the right-hand side, that negative space in between the arm and, and the side of her body, they had still kind of kept that rock there, and it's taken away over on the left-hand side. So it is in with sculpture that the Greeks made their biggest advancements. Uh, they completely transformed sculpture. So, you know, as with anything, it took time. And for change, for this first change to really, really take place and begin, it would happen during the early classical period. So let's talk about this difference. The main difference in appearance between the archaic sculpture and the early classical lies in the pose. So if we look at that Egyptian inspired pose of stiffness, motionless with one leg forward and the other one drawn back. And then then we have this, you know, the left and right sides of the body are symmetrical and we have a break from the archaic smile. So Menkara to standing youth to the Koros. All right, we have this, this change. Things are changing. The Kritos boy is the next step in this evolution of sculpture and the transition of the ideal human form. And the name is because it's believed to be created by Krito, the teacher in, in a, a teacher in Myron, a small island. Now this was found at the Acropolis in about 1866. You gotta understand the, the Acropolis had been through so much. Uh, Persians had come through, it had, it had been burnt down and rebuilt and then destroyed. And so pretty much it's in ruins uh, around the 1860s at this point, it's just been left. So a lot of things are found up there. But the sculpture you know, had been destroyed during the Persian War. And again, in 1866, only the torso at the time um, was found and then the head was found about 30 years later. What they'd actually do is just take all this rubble, what they consider rubble, and throw it and pile it up and left it there. And so I guess maybe around in the 1860s we started to care about that rubble and that's how they start putting these things together. The facial expression. The archaic smile that, that um, characteristic is gone. The face is still relatively expressionless. Um, and the, the carved eyes, which originally would have had inlaid stones, suggest a step towards some personality. So we're, we're moving or carving out some of that stone, and we're actually trying to give it a, a personality by putting a little bit of color in, in the eyes. His stance. How is his stance? This is a big improvement in the human form because artists are understanding how to communicate muscles and definition, how to render flesh, how to make it look more realistic. However, the most striking thing about this figure is the noticeable curve in the spine. It's more natural. The shoulders are slightly shifted, allowing the figure you know, to rest weight on the left leg while the right leg is slightly bent. So we're getting some movement in here. We're not standing so stiff anymore. Look at the difference. Look at the curve in that spine. This is where the change happens, the high classical period. Again, as we know, the Greeks were on a journey to perfecting the human form, and Polyclitus was one of the greatest Greek sculptors of the classical era. He developed a set mathematical equation for constructing the ideal human figure, and to illustrate his theory, he created a larger-than-life bronze sculpture called the Dorf, Dorforis, Doriferous, Doriferous, or the Spear Bearer. 
we are, you know, this this right here, we're looking at a Roman copy. Um, the original would have been cast in bronze. Um, of course, a lot of bronze sculpture throughout history was was melted down, um, you know, or was removed, especially when Christianity came about, because again, these are a people who believed in polytheism, multiple gods, and uh, uh, Christians believe in monotheism, one god, and so of course we got to get rid of all this stuff that's that's just absurd. So they would melt down things and. So anyway, this is what we're looking at right here is a, a Roman copy, and the Romans were known to copy the Greeks. So Doriferous, Doriferous means spear bearer, uh, and he would have originally been holding a bronze spear, um, and he's a canon by Polycletus, which means that he's a, a, a um, model. He's a, a canon was um, a study. Okay, so students would look at this and, and replicate it. And Polyclitus explored and set out to demonstrate the perfection of the human form. Really the idea that you could create a perfect human form based on math. Um, that was the really the bigger, bigger set of ideas for the Greeks. Finding mathematics, finding ratios, and anything was, was the origin of beauty for the Greeks. Okay. Beauty lies in mathematics, symmetry. So Polycletus studied symmetry. He studied proportions and the relationship of weight bearing on one leg while the other leg is relaxed. And this is known as contrapposto. So a term that we use to describe a sculpture um, arrangement where they have the weight on one foot and the figure, you know, again, appears to be putting all the weight on one foot and freeing um, the other leg. So this wasn't a new idea. Earlier Greek artists came up with the technique and demonstrated its abilities, like the Cretan boy we just studied earlier. However, it was Polyclitus who perfected it, who made it look effortless and so natural. Okay, Throughout history, it has been said by many that Polyclitus's Doriferous is the perfect visual expression of the Greek rendering of the idea of the sculpted body. This contrapposto stance. Let's take a look at it. So here's the Cretan boy, and we can see the contrapposto stance, but compared to the spear bearer, it looks stiff. So this technique makes the spear bearer appear to be so relaxed, but he's ready to spring into action at any moment. The spear bearer is one of the earliest statues to be shown in fully developed contrapposto position. So if you look at that left leg is bent so you know, bent like as if he's moving, as if he's walking. The the curve of his spine, it's just perfectly positioned. The Greeks also found the human form to be the you know of the utmost beautiful, all right? They would perform their athletics nude to celebrate the body and its physical abilities. So this celebration of the human body also took precedence, or presence, precedence, shoot. This celebration of the human body also took precedence when artists represented figures in noble pursuit, like this figure. So here we have a figure who's whose uh, clothes have been taken off. This is not because soldiers went into battle nude in ancient Greece, uh, but because this sculpture is not about warfare. It's not a portrait of any individual. This is a sculpture that is about the perfection of the human form. We have movement. We have a very natural looking movement. And for the first time, we have a sculpture that looks alive, like it's walking amongst us like us. So Polyclitus created a counterbalance of weight. His left leg is relaxed while the right is supporting and similarly the right arm is relaxed while the left hand would have been you know weighing bearing the, the, the spear. 
got a little funny meme for you. Wow, is that hepped up? He looks amazing. How is Grease hepped up? You look really relaxed. Yeah, I got into contrapasto over there. It's where you put all your weight on one leg. I feel really dynamic. I love how his hips and shoulder aren't parallel. He just looks so alive and so graceful. Sculpture from the Hellenistic period is very, very different from the Greek art of the classical era. Um, earlier art was idealistic and perfect. The statue resembled Greek gods, you know, but it was during the Hellenistic period, art went under dramatic transformation. Key word here is dramatic. So artists didn't really, you know, entirely abandon their, their predecessors, those before them, um, with how they created sculpture and the ideas of perfection. But instead, these artists kind of explored dramatic poses and emotions. Their sculptures looked realistic the way people, you know, really are, including their flaws. So this is from the Hellenistic uh, period, and this is a piece known as the Venus de Milo. Now, the Venus de Milo is appropriately named for its discovery on the Greek island of Milos, and because it's a representational statue of Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love and beauty. Now, also known, um, you know, as Venus to the Romans. Okay, so when we talk about a Venus uh, in art, or we're talking about a female, um, sometimes in art historians will use the word Venus to, to describe them. So when originally found, the slightly larger than life statue was in two pieces, along with fragments of an upper arm and a pedestal. However, later on these pieces vanished uh, again and have never been found. The, the original appearance has been debated for years as to what she really looked like. So she has shared ideas from the classical period. They haven't, you know, you know vanished, but they've been infused with this um, very expressive Hellenistic era. For instance, the soft face, curvy uh, proportions, um, nudity, these are all characteristics of the classical period. But then look at the draping. Okay, the, the, her, her, her draping seems to be slipping off of her hips. It's very expressive. It's dramatic. And these are, that's what's, you know, typical of the Hellenistic period. And this is a drawing of when the Venus de Milo was found in 1821 that shows her left arm did extend and that the pedestal upon where she stood. Uh, again, that piece is missing and so happened to lose the arm as well. So again, been lost for a long time and have not been able to, to relocate. And then, of course, there's Salvador Dali, who was just in love with this statue uh, and inspired several of his art pieces. If you ever look at a lot of his work, you'll see the Venus de Milo represented in his, his art um, over and over and over again. One of my favorite pieces from the Greek era is the winged victory of Samothrace, known as the Nike. An example of great um, and of Hellenistic change, of dramatic pose, of emotion, that really took place in art. And this sculpture is called the Winged Victory, um, also sometimes referred to as the Nike, who was the, the goddess of victory. The statue is a representation of the Nike Greek goddess. Uh, she's a messenger god who spread the news of victory, of conquest, um, and success from gods to the mortals. So the Nike was sculpted to not only honor the goddess Nike, but also a victory in a naval battle. Now, the statue was found on the Greek island of Samothrace, um, and it was found in a sanctuary in the harbor 
that actually face the winds that, that you know, blow off the coast, which is demonstrated and enlivened in her drapery. However, the sculpture never really did stand on the prow of a real ship. Instead, she stood on the prow of a stone ship um, that was kind of within the temple environment. In ancient times, the island was home to a temple complex known as the Sanctuary of the Great Gods. And the sculpture, when discovered, was found in fragments by uh, a Frenchman's team amongst blocks of gray marble and a small building overlooking the sanctuary. So they searched in vain um, you know, amongst the rubble for statues, arms, and a head, which to this day have never been recovered. So soon after its discovery, the French arranged for the sculpture to be sent to Paris. Um, experts were unable to identify the sculpture, but they did conclude that the sculpture had been erected to commemorate a naval victory um, by a Macedonian general. So in 1875, the blocks of marble amongst the statue um, you know, were discovered, uh, and that was the base. And so and together they formed the prow of the ship on top of which the goddess would stand. The blocks were sent to Paris, and eventually the statue and its base were, were joined uh, and viewed together as they are today, which you can see in the Louvre. So let's talk about the difference in the sculpture versus the classical era. The classical era... Er, The classical era brought a very reserved, quiet, uh, relaxed attitude of the gods. They were, they, you know, there really wasn't much going on, except they were chilling and expecting, you know, accepting honors and, um, you know, the replacement of this classical era kind of, kind of voluptuous uh, energy took place during the Hellenistic period. So this statue gives us a sense as though she's moving in several directions. What's moving her? The wind. And at the same time, she's grounded by her legs standing strong and, and strides forward with her body. And you can almost feel the wind around her. And this is a goddess that's responding to natural forces, to the environment, just as we would have stood you know, fighting the powers of the wind. So here is a culture that has studied the body, that has celebrated the body, and then is evolving to use the body for tremendous expression. Now let's transition into sculpture of ancient Rome. So, you know, like I have said before, the Romans were highly influenced by Greek sculpture. They opened schools specifically to study and copy Greek sculpture. The Romans didn't quite know how to balance their sculptures, so they leave a chunk of marble to make sure it didn't collapse. This is a dead giveaway that there's some odd thing stuck to the lower leg of a figure, that it's Roman. If there is something stuck to the leg or there's something helping hold it up, that's Roman. The Greeks, mm -mm, they would not have stand for that kind of messy imperfection. The Greeks concentrated on the human body and perfecting it. They focused on perfect proportions and athleticism and youthfulism in the gods. The Romans, on the other hand, believed in the importance of real people. Their sculptures concentrated on being realistic. Um, they, you know, created sculptures of real people. They enriched the art of the portrait, both in the homes of wealthy individuals and, and officials and political portraiture. 
Roman sculpture was more than just decoration. It, it had a purpose. Um, it was important for the emperor to spread his image throughout the empire. These empires, these Roman empires, I mean, hundreds of thousands of miles the, the Roman Empire spread. And so it's important that we didn't have televisions, we didn't have, you know, other ways, means of, of seeing um, the, the king or the, the pharaoh or, uh, you know, the emperor. So they had to create a way, you know, for people to, to see his image throughout the entire empire. So this is long before photography, okay? So most people maybe wouldn't have ever seen the emperor. So he wanted uh, you know, a way for the people to see him. He needed them to see him, to establish the idea in their minds that he was the, the rightful heir and the leader of the Roman Empire. So in order to do so, he distributed the likeliness of him um, and through the art. You know, sculptures and, and paintings and even, even on money. So this is a sculpture of Augustus of Prima Porta, and it was found in a villa, which is the home um, of, of Livia, uh, his wife, in the city of Prima Porta. This sculpture had enormous political significance, and it's, it's full of Roman political ideas, um, as was so much of ancient Roman art. So this particular sculpture is most likely a copy of a bronze sculpture. Many, many copies would have been made and it would have you know, been used in a more public environment as well. This sculpture happened to survive because it was in a home. Um, you know, but this, like earlier, like I said, it was really important to spread the likeliness of the emperor through the empire. So, you know, again, they had several of these replicas created. Now, Augustus in this is made to look younger. He is the first emperor of Rome. Okay, so he is, when, when this was created, he was probably in his you know, middle ages. So he's made to look younger, athletic. Um, he's a little bit more handsome looking. And this was a new idea brought in by Augustus. Um, he's using the sculpture in a way to, to communicate to the people of Rome. Before, uh, during the Republic of Rome, um, in order to hold office, you had to be old and experienced. Age was a requirement. So by looking at the statue, do you see a Greek influence? Do you see a particular Greek statue we just finished studying? Same particular stance. Okay. The Doriferous, Polyclitus's Doriferous, right? There's so much about it. Um, you know, he's re recalling on the Greeks he's re to rely his message. Okay, for one thing, the body proportions follow that of the Doriferous. Uh, he is standing in that contrapposto stance, a sculpture that showed the beauty of the body. And so he's really taking on that Greek idea. He's godlike. Um, he's displaying his lineage. How is he doing that? You know, you see this this angel. Well, that's not an angel. Um, that's that's not a baby. Um, that's Cupid, the son of the goddess Venus. And so, Augustus was was uh, saying that he was a descendant of the goddess. Uh, According to Caesar, Caesar related himself back to Venus, um, and so Augustus was the adopted son of Caesar, so therefore he is showing his lineage uh, back to the gods, showing that he is part uh, divine, and that uh, by placing Cupid at his side, he's, he's showing this, this connection. And, you know, Cupid is actually sitting upon a dolphin, which again shows a relationship to Venus because she was born from the sea. So 
Augustus has God written all over him. Uh, in fact, his, his breastplate um, continues the message of being divine. It has the God of the sky, the God of the earth on it. Uh, I'm sorry, goddess of the earth. So all these divine forces are coming together here for Augustus's rule. And additionally, his breastplate, uh, breastplate is like a personal you know, resume. It's depicting the defeat of an older en enemy of Rome. So right there in the center part of it, you can see on the left-hand side that figure. That figure is representing Rome. And then if the figure on the right-hand side is a more barbaric looking figure. Um, and that is a, a empire that they have defeated. Uh, and what's happening is they're giving back um, the Roman standard, which would have been these like little sticks that you would have carried into to battle. It would kind of been like capture the flag kind of thing. And so they are returning it to Rome. It's showing um, the, the end of this war. And so this is kind of, you know, like what Augustus was doing is he's saying, look what I've done for Rome. I finally got our Roman standard back from these these barbarians, uh, and, and I'm showing you that we're going to now have peace over our Roman Empire. And in fact, they do. So this sculpture is a, is a tremendously powerful visual piece of Roman propaganda. Marcus Aurelius, this is what this statue is, equestrian meaning um, military or doing things with horses. If you ever see equestrian statue that's talking about something on a horse. And so Marcus Aurelius was a very successful military commander uh, and he was also a, a um, an emperor. And so he commissioned this statue to honor and show such dignity. So this statue is one of the only surviving bronze sculptures of the time and the only equestrian statue of its size to survive antiquity. And we know that, you know, here had been dozens of equestrian statues. Um, they're, they're political propaganda. They were designed to commemorate triumph, uh, return of a successful emperor. But after the Roman Empire, the, the collapse of the Roman Empire, um, Christians came. And again, they melted all the bronze sculptures that the pagans, the Romans, had created. Uh, so this statue, by mere luck, survived the Middle Ages because it was actually mistaken for a statue of Constantine. We'll learn about him in a little bit. But Constantine was a, a was made Christian. Um, uh, and he made Christianity really legal in Rome, and he was the first Christian emperor. So, of course, they're going to allow that to stay. Now it's in a museum um, that's being, you know, that's helping um, conserve it. Um, so we really don't know the original location in ancient Greek or ancient Rome. Um, however, we do know where you know Michelangelo. Um, placed it during the Renaissance. So Michelangelo was really inspired by this. And this statue had an enormous influence on the Renaissance. Uh, it became a canon, a study, like Polyclitus's, you know, spear bearer. So not only for its design, but also for how it was cast. If you remember, I told you that um, the, the technique of, of casting kind of got lost and so this is a, a statue that was cast, uh, so they studied it um, to, you know, really to make this, they made it in smaller pieces and they would have cast those pieces and then welded them together or connected them together. Um, so the bronze would have been really smooth to make it look like one piece. So if it wasn't for this piece of, of sculpture, the the technique would have been lost for who knows how long. So the emperor is over life size and has the right hand stretched out, much like Augustus of Prima Porta, the sculpture, because he's addressing the, the Roman citizens. So while his left hand would have been holding the reins of the horse, the statue is meant to portray the emperor as victorious, 
Uh, he's all conquering. Again, right hand extending towards, you know, forward, creating a sense of, of movement in the sculpture. Uh, we have folds in the neck of the horse um, as a reaction to the tugging of the reins and the left hand tugging ever so slightly to cause the horse to kind of pull back. So the decline of the Roman Empire. Dun, dun, dun. So from about 211 to 284 CE, CE, the Common Era, um, there were a total of 27 emperors. Very short period of time, but had 27 emperors. Only four of these men died of natural causes. Um, you know, the others were just simply murdered. There was really no way to remove an emperor, so let's murder them. Um, and, and this really weakened Rome and, and signaled the decline of this empire. So Diocletian was a brilliant politician and general who, you know, was trying to preserve the declining empire. So in order for you know Diocletian to do this, he divided the emperor into two halves. I'm sorry, the empire into two halves and established a new governing structure known as the tetrarch or the rule of a four. Okay, so he divided this into the east and west and he had a total of four who ruled over that entire uh, empire. Two would have ruled the east, two would have ruled the west. Okay, so again you had two Augusti or the the main guy, the, the senior emperor, and then you would have had two uh, Caesars, um, one under each Augusti, and they would be the junior ones. Okay, and the idea was pretty simple. Um, you know, after 20 years, the the Augusti emperor would step down, and the Caesar emperor would take their place. And Diocletian's idea was that. Uh, at the death or the retirement of the Augustus, his Caesar would replace him, and that Caesar would then pick a new Caesar to replace his position. And this was, you know, Diocletian's hope to stop the murderers and instability of, of the past several years. The first tetrarch was ruled by Maximus and Diocletian, um, and they, they, you know, they were the Augusti. And then Constantine and uh, Galerius uh, were their Caesars. So it's, you know, this is a sculpture created for them. And it's really hard to tell them apart. They are nearly identical. Apart from the fact that two of the figures have beards. So most likely the Augusti would have, you know, been more experienced, much older, uh, and then the two clean-shaven figures would have been the Caesars. And this is something very different from previous portraits of the emperors. Imperial portraits were individualized. They were real portraits um, that you could recognize. They were used for political propaganda. They would have, you know, been distributed across the empire. Disregard of the individual. Okay, these are very similar posi positions. Their bodies are the same size. Their face looks exactly the same, apart from the beards. Um, you know, they're they're rather abstract. Even the drapery is abstract, rather than realistic. Where what about the contrapposto? Uh, the understanding of, of, of muscular um, and bone structure. Where is the art that had influenced the legacy of, of, of ancient Greece and Rome? Where is that realistic feature? So this is carved from four eye stone, which is a very rare stone imported from Egypt. The four eye is a very, very hard stone, which makes it extremely difficult uh, to carve, more so than marble. Um, and this was actually a, a purple stone and was reserved for the emperors, 
Um, so if you ever see this, the, the imagery is most likely that of an emperor. So some art historians think that uh, the, that might have been an impact on the look of the sculpture, why it looks so stylized, okay, because it was difficult to, to cut. But there are other examples of realistic sculptures done using the same stone that kind of squashes that idea. So this abstract look was done purposefully and was a decision. So each pair is embracing and this is a symbolic or of, of imperial strength, of harmony, of working together. The Tetriarch lasted 27 years, so not very long. And in, in 311 um, CE, uh, two men claimed to be the sole emperor of the empire. These two men battled, and that was Constantine, uh, and he defeated his rival to become the sole heir. So the night before the battle took place, Constantine claimed to have seen a vision in the sky. He claimed to see the Greek letter uh, Chiroth, the first two letters of the Greek word Christos, in a Latin phrase uh, meaning, in this sign you will conquer. So he instructed his soldiers to paint the Chiroth uh, Christian logo on their shields. And at this time, Constantine, he was not a Christian. His mother was, but he was not. So when he won, he gave credit for his victory to the Christian God. And Constantine the Great uh, decriminalized Christianity. He ended up, um, you know, he ended the persecution of Christians, and he recognized Christianity as a, as a lawful religion. He was the first emperor to convert to Christianity, but he did this on his deathbed. He also moved the Roman Empire. So if you look down at the bottom left, you can see where the capital of Rome was. And whenever Constantine took place, he moved it all the way to Constantinople, um, which is modern day Istanbul, Turkey. Now, he was always, you know, seeking to impress the people of Rome with visual symbols of his authority. Uh, and so he commissioned a colossal 40-foot high portrait statue of himself. Uh, and it's been placed, or it was placed in a, a Basilica Nova, which would have been a, a very public building. Today, only fragments of the statue remain. The whole statue uh, was not made of marble although those are the pieces that, that remain behind. Uh, it's thought that his core was constructed of brick, wood, and, and gilded bronze. Now, again, you think about this, uh, you know, the bronze would have definitely been melted down over time. Wood is not one of those uh, long-lasting, durable um, mediums. And again, brick, you know, just would have been destroyed. So this sculpture breaks from the realistic look, um, you know, and, and heading is heading towards that more stylized, abstract look that you could definitely see, especially when you look at his eyes. They're, they're very geometric. And he's looking up, uh, you know, and his right hand points up as well towards the heavens, towards the Christian God. That's just a theory. And this is where kind of inside that middle part um, that he would have sat this colossal statue. All right, so that does it for ancient Greek and Roman sculpture.